Well, hello and welcome everyone to this uh, edition of the worship service for December 13th with Island Baptist Church. Uh, we are back online and recording our sermons and our lessons for YouTube. Uh, sadly, we're not able to meet in person today because of the uh, coronavirus increase in Hong Kong. And so we've recorded these videos. So if you're watching it on the weekend of December 13th, that's why you're seeing this message. I'll also say very briefly that if you've already watched the Sunday school lesson, uh, you may be wondering what had happened. Uh, I had said in the Sunday school hour that uh, we had hoped for Pastor Matt to be able to share the worship service, but you pray for him. He's feeling a little bit under the weather, and I was already ready to go for the worship service uh, as well. So here I am again. My apologies that you got to see me twice. Lord willing, if Pastor Matt's uh, feeling uh, better next week, then we'll be able to see him for the worship service. I hope you'll tune in then. Uh, you can pray for him in the meanwhile. Also do pray for some of our members as they'll be traveling, the Herbster family at the end of the month, and also a Sister Claire, who will be returning to the Philippines. Uh, we ask that you pray for her on her way back. Well, again, I'm excited to be with you for this worship service hour. We're going to be continuing, or not an hour, it's going to be shorter than that. We're going to be continuing our study of the book of Philippians. And if you'd like to go ahead and open up your Bibles to Philippians chapter 3, that's where we're going to be in just a moment. Um, another funny thing I had said in the Sunday school hour was, no, I did not forget to shave. Uh, three things. Number one, it's December and normally uh, around winter, the beard starts coming back. Number two, with us wearing our masks every day, almost all day uh, out in town, I decided to let my face have a rest. And number three, I wanted to see how many of you were paying attention and noticing during the Sunday school hour and the worship time. So that's my, my reason for that. But we are glad to have you with us today. We have uh, hoped even last week to be in our new location, the new location of Island Baptist Church at the Kingdom Power Building. Uh, the renovations there have gone very well. Praise the Lord. Thank you for your prayers and for your giving and for your help, many of you who are involved in that. And sadly, even though we could get into the building to have church, we can't right now because of social distancing and the government restrictions. But you pray that in the Lord's good time, we'd be able to come back together for that. One more thing I'll say before we get into the message, I will give you more updates next week about the church and how it looks and even the new sign out on the street. Uh, but also, Lord willing, if it works out, uh, I'll have a link in the description down below that will have a recording that uh, Tiffany Herbster, Annie Herbster, Jonathan Herbster, and Catherine were able to work together to do a little bit of instrumental Christian music. And I'll try to have a link up to that video as well if you would like to pull that up for part of your worship today. All right. So for us today, we are going to be in Philippians chapter 3. And as you turn in your Bibles there, Paul again has transitioned back to kind of some personal um, instruction for the Philippians that he's going to be base, uh, basing in this chapter from his own life. And for me in Philippians, I love every chapter of the book. But within each chapter, there's a section that I really especially like. And in Philippians chapter 3, towards the end of the chapter, I'm excited for us to be reminded about some of the things that Paul taught there. But it's important for us to get through verses 1 through 11 and see how Paul is going to ground that later lesson for you and for me, especially from lessons he's learned in his own life. And the title of the lesson today may sound a little bit unusual, uh, depending on how you're used to this word or not. But the title of the lesson today is reckoning our rubbish, reckoning our rubbish. Now here in Hong Kong, instead of saying trash or garbage, trash cans and garbage cans and garbage pails, we say rubbish and rubbish bins. Um, but the word rubbish means trash and the word reckon means to count, to account something or count something to be true. You know, if you've listened to me in the last several series, I like the word reckon. And Paul here in this chapter is going to reckon some things in his life to be rubbish, to be trash. He's going to count them as worthless compared to something else. Now, what I hope you'll do today is you'll apply it to your life as I will apply it to my life, and that we'd be able to see not just through the eyes of Paul, but we'd be able to see like Paul did, that when we compare many things in our life to what we have in the person of Jesus Christ, they don't have any comparison. They pale in comparison, and in fact, 
they're trash or they're worthless. I hope that gets you interested because you say, well, listen, what would be in my life that would be counted as worthless compared to Christ? We'll see. What we're also going to see is how we are supposed to have hope and confidence. We're going to see how Paul remembers where his confidence lies. And if you did not watch Sunday School, there are some good connections that we're going to see, uh, believe it or not, about the hope of resurrection. So go back and see that if you missed it. So let's go ahead and begin by reading in our Bibles, chapter 3, and I'm just going to read verses 1 and 2 to begin. Paul begins the chapter by saying, Finally, my brethren, rejoice in the Lord. To write the same things to you, to me, indeed, is not grievous, but for you it is safe. Beware of dogs, beware of evil workers, beware of the concision. So this is where Paul begins this chapter by giving uh, some warnings and says he's going to repeat some instruction that he had given before. So the first reckoning of three that Paul is going to give, the first reckoning or thing that we're supposed to count on and account is a confident reminder that Paul is going to give about the relationship we have with the Lord. Okay, as he begins this, the first verses that I read was he wants them to understand what false teaching was and what false teaching was coming to them most specifically. There was a group of people that we get to see hints of in the book of Acts that were hounding or chasing after Paul everywhere he would go in his missionary journeys. This was a group of people that sometimes we call Judaizers, and we don't mean that they were merely trying to make people Jewish. We mean they were trying to make them follow the Jewish law. We also see this sometimes called as legalist or legalism. And let me be real clear about that because that term gets bandied about and abused. Legalism technically in the New Testament sense was those people who were telling others that if they would follow the Old Testament commands and laws or some set of laws and behaviors, that was the way that they would be righteous with God. That was the way that they would have works pleasing to God. And that was even the way that they would be saved or safe. So it's almost like a mixture of works with salvation. Now, sometimes people get grumpy and angry and uh, maybe condescending towards people who have different standards or who are more traditional, who are more conservative, and they try to disparage others and call them a legalist. Well, that's not technically true unless that person thinks that their works or their, uh, their decisions apart from God's word are saving them. That's usually not the case. So just to be clear, if you want to see this story, you can go back to the book of Acts. You could really read anywhere, maybe start around chapters 13, 14, especially 15 and 16, and you're going to see this dynamic. So Paul, he says, I want to tell you about something. It's not tiresome for me. It's not grievous, but it's very necessary. It's something you need to know about, and it's safe for you. Let me flesh this out to make sure you understand what was happening. People were coming to the new churches in Philippi and Colossae and Ephesus and all over the, the Middle East and the Mediterranean, parts of Southern Europe and even into Asia Minor, and they were coming along to the new Christians, and they were saying, ah, you've heard of the Messiah, Jesus. You've heard of the baptism of John. Very good. But are you keeping the commandments of God? Are you living as a child of God should live? And asking them even things like, do you follow our dietary law? Do you wear the clothing we wear? Do you celebrate our holidays as Jews? And even to say, are you circumcising your young uh, children, your boys? And so they were trying to tell people that there was some type of outside requirements. You noticed all the things that I said, right? I said clothing, diet, circumcision, celebrations. These things that are mentioned in Colossians as being shadows that are pointing to Christ in the Old Testament, but they are not the real thing. They're not Christ himself. So Paul, as he warns them, he says, listen, beware of dogs, beware of evil workers, and beware of the concision. That word means really the cutting. And Paul is saying, beware of people who tell you you need to have the circumcision, or even as he would be referencing it here, almost like a mutilation to be accepted with God, to do something on the outside that's going to make you accepted with God. That is dangerous and wrong. 
Now, those three phrases Paul uses, he could be talking about dangerous Gentiles, dangerous evil people, and dangerous people who are, are coming from a Jewish perspective. But really, the main focus here is on people who are putting confidence in the flesh and instead of the work of God through the Holy Spirit as we trust Christ for the forgiveness of our sins. Uh, one more thing I'd like to read before we get off of this. I mentioned Colossians chapter 2. You can turn there with me. Uh, Paul is talking about these people who were, again, paying too much attention to the life of the flesh. I'll begin reading in verse 16. He says, Let no man therefore judge you in meat or in drink or in respect of an holy day or the new moon or the Sabbath days, which are a shadow of things to come, but the body is of Christ. Let no man beguile you or trick you of your reward in a voluntary humility and worshiping of angels, trying to get you to do these outside rituals, intruding into those things which he hath not seen, vainly puffed up by his fleshly mind and not holding the head from which all the body by joints and bands having nourishment ministered and knit together increaseth with the increase of God. It's saying, listen, those people who are trying to make you focus on the flesh, give you religious rituals, make you worship angels, they're entering into things they don't even know about, and they're neglecting the head, Jesus Christ. Now that neglect to focus on Jesus Christ, Paul's going to remedy in the chapter we're in today. But even here in Colossians chapter 2, when it talks about Jesus Christ, he's saying, why are people bringing you back into bondage with all these rules and requirements and telling you that's how you get accepted with God? In verse uh, 1 of chapter 3, still in Colossians, Paul says this, If ye then be risen with Christ, seek those things which are above, where Christ sitteth on the right hand of the Father. Set your affection on things above, not on things on the earth. For ye are dead, and your life is hid with Christ in God. When Christ, who is our life, shall appear, then shall ye also appear with him in glory. I could just go on reading those wonderful verses. But Paul is saying in chapter 2 of Colossians and chapter 3, chapter 3 here in Philippians, don't let people trick you into thinking that your works will save you or your outward behavior is what makes you right with God. Now, let me say this. We know that this is how all the other religions of the world teach. Sadly, this is even what the Roman Catholic Church would teach or the Orthodox churches would teach. That's big O Orthodox, like Greek and Russian and so on, is that somehow your works and your behavior and your rituals and the sacraments are somehow saving you along with what Christ has done. And that's missing the point that is here. Other religions teach you that you're saved by works and not by faith. And that's not what is here. So Paul was saying, beware of those people. Watch out for them. Here's what you need to reckon. Reckon that they are wrong and reckon that the true teaching is an inward relationship with the Lord is what is most important. Look down now in Philippians chapter 3 again at verse 3. He says, these people want to talk about circumcision and identifying with the Jewish nation. Let me tell you about circumcision, the true type of relationship to have with the Lord. Verse 3, for we are the circumcision which worship God in the spirit and rejoice in Christ Jesus and have no confidence in the flesh. If you're listening to this message today and your hope of heaven is in what you have done, a ritual you went through, your good works or how nice a person you are, or even your acts of charity, you have confidence in your flesh and you are not saved if that's what you're only trusting in. So the Bible says that our trust and our hope, as we're going to see today, is to be in Jesus Christ alone, that he alone is the only one who can save us from our sins, who can forgive us and make us to be pure and acceptable before the Lord. We have no confidence in our own flesh. Now, obviously, God wants us in the flesh to do what's right. God wants us to behave well. God wants us to follow his law as it applies to us in the New Testament. God wants us to be full of good works and good fruits for him. But you and I don't place our confidence in our works to save us. Now, we can look at our works and our life 
and their absence, by the way, can be a warning to us, but we can look at their presence as an assurance or an indication that our lives have been transformed by Jesus Christ and by the sanctifying Holy Spirit dwelling within us, but it is not what we trust in, in, in terms of our salvation and our confidence. So reckoning number one is our confidence is not in the flesh. Our confidence is in Christ. And don't let anybody mislead you by this. Let me give you one more application uh, just on the side here. If you are struggling with uh, your sins as a Christian, if you're struggling with disappointment and fear because you have sinned against the Lord, you've done that which is wrong, your works have not been what they should, you are clear perhaps on your salvation, you've trusted Jesus for the forgiveness of your sins, you're depending on him entirely and not yourself, but you've stumbled and you've fallen, and now you're thinking to yourself, I've messed up. I've sinned against God in such a terrible way. I must be lost. I can't be his child. Listen, friends, that's another way to put your confidence in the flesh. And you say, but pastor, I have no confidence in myself. That's what makes me worried. No, listen, you're still thinking, perhaps, that it's you yourself that are saving you or assuring you or making you safe. No, listen, both the beginning of your salvation, the surety of your salvation, and even the continuance of your salvation is in the hand of our Lord. Paul's going to say at the end of this that he doesn't behave that way. He doesn't act as if uh, he's just simply floating along on a river of God's grace. But he does say here that his confidence is in what Jesus Christ has done, not what he is doing. All right, that's reckoning number one. Number two is counting some things as rubbish. Now you're going to get to see why we titled the message this way. The second reckoning is Paul counts some things as rubbish. And the first one we're going to see is his past hopes. You say, Pastor, that's very strange. What do you mean by counting as rubbish his past hopes? Let's read verses 4, 5, and 6 to see how. Paul says this back in verse 3 at the end. He says, I have no confidence in the flesh, though I might, verse 4, also have confidence in the flesh. I could have confidence, he says, according to those Judaizers, according to those legalists, according to their standards, I could have some great confidence. Why? If any other man thinketh that he have whereof he might trust in the flesh, I more. He's saying from those Jewish legalist perspectives, I had it better than them. I had greater reason to trust. Verse 5, he says, circumcise the eighth day, of the stock of Israel, of the tribe of Benjamin, an Hebrew of the Hebrews. So that's the first part, his birth. Some of these uh, zealots, we might say, or the Jewish legalists, some of them might have even been converts from other nations, like Gentiles who had become Jewish believers trying to fulfill the law. Paul here is saying, listen, first of all, I was from the tribe of Israel naturally. I was from a prestigious tribe that had been faithful at some points in the Old Testament. I was circumcised the right day in the right way by the proper Jewish custom. I was a Hebrew of the Hebrews. That's his birth. Then he goes on to talk about his work. He says, as touching the law, I was a Pharisee. He's saying, I knew what the law was. I meditated on it. I memorized it. And I believed I had to obey it. Not only that, as a Pharisee, he would have been one of those who put a hedge about the law. So again, I've shared this with you. If the Bible said that you're not supposed to do work on a Sabbath day, not supposed to dig a hole, the uh, many of the Pharisees would not even move a chair because they thought maybe the leg of the chair would dig a hole in the dirt or the floor. Or even today, for people who are Jewish and, and very, very orthodox like the Pharisees, if it said don't light a fire, they won't turn on an electrical outlet uh, because of the electrical spark being like a fire. So Paul was saying... I really followed the law as a Pharisee. Then he goes on to say this. He says, concerning zeal, persecuting the church, touching the righteousness which is in the law, blameless. He said, so I attacked the Christians for believing in their uh, in Jesus Christ alone, for their belief in salvation apart from works. I tried to put them to death. And he goes on to say, when it came to the law, as far as I know, I was blameless. I was doing everything that I was supposed to do. That was Paul's pedigree, where he came from. He could have been much more confident than maybe you and I as regards the Old Testament law. But now he goes on to say, however, his position was not based in that. 
He said all of these things were worthless. Look at verse 7. But what things were gained to me, those I counted loss for Christ. He says, I think those things were worthless apart from Christ. Now, we should be clear about this. Obviously, God was able to use Paul's past. Obviously, God was able to use Paul's uh, ethnicity, his heritage, his religious study in a mighty way. So we're not telling you today to just dismiss everything that God's done in your life, in your heritage, and even before you were a Christian. But what it's saying is this. When compared to Christ, those things were worthless. He says, those things I counted lost for Christ. Worthless, yes, but also he was willing to give them up and turn away from them. You say, but what about his reputation with the other Pharisees? He gave it up. What about the implication that maybe he was no longer a law keeper? He says, I'm willing to suffer that. He says, I'm willing to put all that away because I see what is really worthwhile in Jesus Christ. That's his second reckoning. Now let's go to the third reckoning, and we'll also transition to a remembrance of our hope. The third reckoning, which is counted as rubbish, that's what it says behind my video there, is the present hardships that he was going. Remember, Paul is writing from prison. He's in trouble. He's in difficulty. And he says, you know what? I count even those things as rubbish. Let's look down in our Bibles at what Paul says in this way here. He says, Suffering is nothing, and Christ is everything. Let, let's look down in our Bible. Excuse me, I'll move this so you can see it. In verse 8, it says, Yea, doubtless, and I count all things but lost for the excellency of the knowledge of Christ Jesus my Lord, for whom I have suffered the loss of all things, and do count them but dung, that I may win Christ. Isn't that incredible? He's saying, listen, even though I had those things behind me, even though at present I've gone through sufferings, none of those are counted as anything. In fact, they are like dung, refuse, rubbish, sewage, compared to what I have in Jesus Christ. Not only do they pale in comparison, they are of no account. They are of no comparison because Christ is everything. That's what he is, he's claiming in this way. Now, for you and for me, please don't, don't miss this. We are going through difficulties in our lives. Many of us are. There are challenges from coronavirus, from the pandemic, from being separated from our families, from job losses, and, and many different things. And there really is suffering that is there. And we could look at that and we could say, well, you know what? Compared to what I have in Christ, those things don't matter. In fact, that's close to what the Sunday school lesson was about, if you want to go back and watch it. But what Paul is talking about here, make sure we get what he's really talking about, was even suffering for Christ, even turning from that hope and confidence in the flesh to depending entirely on Christ, it was totally worth it. Christ is so much far better than anything else that even the suffering is something that is counted as nothing and less than nothing. He desires, it says here, to have the excellency of the knowledge of Christ Jesus my Lord. He's going to flesh that out. He says, it is worth more than anything for me to know Jesus Christ as my Savior and to have a relationship with Him. All right, let's see how Paul goes on to elaborate this in these following verses. Remember what he said, everything is in Christ, or is, is most important, we'd say, most valuable in Jesus Christ himself. Let's just go ahead and read verses 9 through 11, and we'll come back and summarize them. He says, uh, following up from verse 8, and he says, For whom, that's Christ, I have suffered the loss of all things, and do count them but dung, that I may win Christ, and be found in him, not having mine own righteousness, which is of the law, but that which is through the faith of Christ, the righteousness which is of God by faith, that I may know him and the power of his resurrection and the fellowship of his sufferings, being made conformable unto his death, if by any means I might attain unto the resurrection of the dead. Now let me say this. One of the reasons why this is one of my favorite sections in chapter 3 uh, and, and next week as well. One of the reasons why this is one of my favorite parts of the book of Philippians is because Paul is saying he was trying to win Christ. He's trying to be found acceptable with Christ. 
He's trying to, we can say, attain unto the resurrection. He's using all these trying and striving words, and it might make you think that he doesn't have confidence at all, but that's not true. The rest of this chapter is going to go on to remind us Paul knows that God is his confidence. Paul knows that God is the one who is keeping him safe. Paul knows God is the one who saved him in the first place. But Paul says, as for my behavior, I'm going to live and strive and work hard and try to walk pleasing in the eyes of the Lord and live up to the high calling I have in Jesus Christ. So don't miss it. Here's the irony. There's a group of people out there who's telling you to try to live a good life so that you can be saved. Paul here is saying, I have confidence that I am saved, and so I am trying to live the best life I can in the Lord. The motivations here are totally different. The motivation of the one person is thinking that somehow they can earn their way into heaven and a type of fear that maybe they'll fail and they would not be able to get into heaven. Over here, you've got perfect confidence in what Christ has done, but our motivation is because we love him, we want to serve him. So we reckon the present, the past, and we reckon that false teaching as not being worthy, but we need to remember that in Christ we have great worth uh, in Him. We can see. So let's look at these and again see the details of them. So in, in these verses that Paul gave, I'll put them all up on the screen because I've got them out of order. In verse 9, he focuses on the righteousness in Christ by faith. Remember what he says? To be found in Him not having my own righteousness, but instead the righteousness, we can say, which is through the faith of Christ, the righteousness which is of God by faith. We, we've shared before, and Pastor Matt had helped some of you at church to learn the song of Jesus, thy blood and righteousness, to say that we get the honor of being dressed in the righteousness of Christ as Christians. Remember, I've challenged you before. Go back and look at Ephesians chapter 1, chapter 2, chapter 3, and see how your righteous standing comes for a Christian if you are in Christ Jesus, that God the Father, instead of looking on us and seeing us as sinful people that we are, he sees the righteousness of Christ, and we are accepted in Christ Jesus. I've used this illustration uh, with you many times before. I don't have my, uh, my uh, bag with me, but you've heard me use the illustration of a cup before. Uh, and and I'll, I'll use this in a different way. Normally, I use it when I talk about the Holy Spirit. But if I were to hide my savings in here, if I were to put all my money in here in, in big bills— and I put this cup on a shelf. You came to my house and you were cleaning it out and you looked and you said, you know, uh, Jonathan, this cup doesn't look like it's worth anything. Can I throw it out? I'd say, no, 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 please don't do it. Right. Because of valuing the thing that's inside. We've talked about that with the Holy Spirit, that you as a Christian have an earnest of your inheritance because we can say that the Holy Spirit in you dwelling in you is something that is precious to the Lord. It's an earnest that we are going to be saved. Now, let, let's change the illustration and let's do something that's different. If we change the illustration and say that instead the outside is very valuable, then that changes the way we would look at it. For instance, I have, I've, I've used this before, I have bags and satchels and, and things that I carry to work. But you know what I do? I, unfortunately, put a lot of trash inside of my bags. I get a receipt, I put it in my bag. I use a straw, I put the trash in my bag. Uh, lots of things get into my bag. And if you were to look at my bag, sometimes it's full of trash. Now, I clean it out every once in a while. But if you were to say uh, to me, is that trash safe at this moment? Right now, downstairs, the trash is safe because it's in my bag. And I don't want my bag thrown away because it's usually also got my wallet and my keys and other things. So the bag is special to me. Whatever's inside is also safe, even if it's trash. Now, that's a silly illustration, but what I'm trying to say is this. Christians, you are told that you right now are in Christ Jesus, safe in Him. There's no way that God the Father is going to throw away the Son. There's no way the Father is going to reject and turn away from His dear Son, the Lord Jesus Christ, now. And so you are safe, hidden in Him. Now that, compared to all the confidence you might have in the flesh, that compared to all your good works, that compared to any ritual you could do, 
whether it be taking communion, whether it be this Jewish circumcision, whether it be keeping a holy day, that is all worthless compared to the righteousness of being in Jesus Christ by faith. Can't you see how this is so transformative that it changed the world, not only in the New Testament, but also in the period of the Reformation as well, to know that we have that righteous standing in the beloved. Friends, one more time, if you're listening to the message, you're confident in yourself and you say, well, listen, hey, I just hope someday it works out. I hope someday my good deeds outweigh my bad. You are completely mistaken. The only way to be righteous in the eyes of the Lord is through faith, as we just saw in his son, Jesus Christ, the forgiveness of sins that he offers from verse nine. All right. Then Paul goes on in verse 10 to say this, that I may know him and the power of of his resurrection. I'll do the knowledge of Christ's person and empowered by the knowledge of Christ's resurrection to know who Jesus Christ is. Like I just said, to know the salvation that's in him, to know his behavior, to know his love, to know his confidence, to gaze on him in the gospels and to study his person, to know the confidence we have in him, and then also the correction that Christ brings to our life is invaluable. And then also we can say that the power of his resurrection, to know that and to know again that the Lord raised up Jesus Christ and that the Bible says because of the resurrection, we have the hope of eternal life and that we are also seated in the heavenlies with him. This brings, we can say, a great confidence to us. Again, a good tie into our Sunday school lesson if you haven't watched it. Then also in verse 10, he says towards the end of the verse, being made conformable unto his death, like unto his death, willing to suffer with him, even we would say changed into his obedience. I think this is tied to chapter two. You remember in chapter two, when we talked about Jesus Christ and how he humbled himself, I'll go back and read these verses. It says, he made himself of no reputation, took upon him the form of a servant, was made in the likeness of men, being found in fashion as a man, he humbled himself and became obedient unto death, even the death of the cross. Paul was finding that he was sharing in Christ's sufferings, and that was valuable to him, that he was even going to be as obedient, he would say, in imitation to his Lord, to the point of dying for the Lord. And that was fulfilled, by the way, in Paul. It wasn't just empty talk for him. Then lastly, we've already read it, raised at Christ's coming. He says, if by any means I might attain unto the resurrection of the dead. Now, one more time, as you read that, you say, wait, does Paul think he's not going to attain unto the resurrection of the dead? No, he's already said he's confident in the Lord. He's going to tell us again in a few more verses that he is confident in the Lord. But he's saying, I'm living as if I can attain unto it, that I can live up to it, that I would be living worthy of this resurrection hope. And it's almost as if he's saying, I'm not even letting myself think that I've already arrived, I've already attained, but instead I'm pressing towards the mark. Those of you who have read your Bibles here, you know that's exactly what he's going to say in the next several verses. We're not going to go there right now, but what I wanted you to see in this listing from verses 9 and 10 and 11, that he says, you know what, look at what I've got in Christ, this righteousness that's in him, in him to know him, to be empowered by the knowledge of his resurrection, to be able to share in his sufferings and know that they're purposeful and not pointless, to even be changed into an obedience to God, which I'm willing even to go to the death and to then be living in such a way that it's worthy of this resurrection that I've been promised in Christ. All of that to Paul, he reckoned and counted that as being so much more valuable than his sufferings, so much more valuable than the past. Now listen, this is what the text is about. Paul's life and how it was a great correction against those legalists. A great correction against those people who have confidence in the flesh. That's the primary application here. So for you and for me, I hope it's well clear by now, you can't save yourself. You're not saved by your works. But I would say this, friends, as another application to this, when we look at what we've got in Christ, Nothing else comes anywhere near to that value. When we look at Christ and what we have in him, the hope that we have in him, the joys we have in him, the blessings that we have in him, that enables us and equips us to go through, yes, hardships, to look at our past and say, you know what? 
None of those things really matter to me. You know what? What matters most to me is to know the Lord Jesus Christ and to walk pleasing to Him. I think this can be transformative for you and for me because when we're in difficulties like we are now, when we're facing challenges like we have in 2020, and for uh, many of you, even in the year previous, we can say, you know what? The thing that is of most worth and value to me is my relationship to the, to the Lord, Jesus Christ. And that hasn't been changed and it hasn't been cut off. We talked about this, by the way, in Sunday school. You can go back and, and see some illustrations of this passage that we're talking about right here. But for you, let me ask the reverse of this. For Christians, I, I specifically want to talk to Christians right now. Are you treating worthless things as if they mattered the most to you? Or are you treating things that do have some worth, they have some value, they're good, but are you treating them as more important than the Lord Jesus Christ? I mean, for some of you, maybe a lot of our suffering this year is because you have put too much hope, joy, and confidence in things that can be shaken and that things that can be taken away. I mean, I, I am disappointed and sad myself that I can't travel home to see my dear family in the United States. I'm sad that I wasn't able to go up into China to see brothers and sisters there that I miss and to travel with my uh, Chinese brothers in, into China. Uh, I've been frustrated, we can say, by the challenges with school and, and with difficulties here. I'm sad that we can't meet together at church. But you know what? In all of these different things, I don't want my greatest joy, my greatest hope, and my greatest confidence to be in things like traveling, like leisure, like vacation, or even things that are better, like job security, or the things where, like going to see our family. Those are all good things, but you know what? We've got to have them in the proper perspective. They can be wonderful things, but they're not the most important thing in your life as a Christian. And for us, we got to see this from Paul. Paul is, again, remember, rebuking this wrong teaching, but I think there's also a lesson for you and for me for how we value things in our life. And I hope you'll make that application as well today. So when we look at this, how do you count things in your life? How do you reckon them in your life? I hope you do not reckon yourself as saving yourself. That's clear from today. I hope also that you don't reckon other things in your life to be more valuable than the things of God. Remember Colossians chapter 3 verse 1, turn your eyes back on the thing that is most important. Now, I want to give you some, we can say, uh, some, some follow-up to this message. Read the rest of chapter 3 and see how Paul speaks. But he's also going to describe a group of people that did just the opposite of what he's doing. Just the opposite of counting these other things as rubbish and counting Christ as supreme. There's going to be a group of people who are introduced to us in chapter 3. We'll talk about them in the weeks to follow, where they are valuing the things of earth most highly of all. It's a great rebuke to me. It may be to you to correct your vision, to get you from focusing on your own flesh, your own life, your own belly, your own world, and to get our eyes lifted back up to the Lord. So as I said in Sunday school, maybe God in his grace, as he's doing many, many things in our lives, maybe one of the things he's doing during this difficult season is he's trying to get you and me to count the most important things as most important to reckon the glory and the gifts we have in Jesus Christ as being the thing that's going to be most safe and most satisfactory to us. Let's pray and ask God to help us with this big challenge. Dear Heavenly Father, we do thank you so much for your word today, for Paul's correction of the false teaching. We get to see, Lord, that we should have no confidence in our flesh, that we cannot save ourselves or follow and keep certain laws that would make us safe with you, but instead that we need to have our confidence in the Lord Jesus Christ, what he's done, his death for our sins and the resurrection unto eternal life. And Father, help us to have our great joy and confidence in him. Father, even help us to weigh our experiences and our past, whether it be our strengths or our sufferings. Help us to weigh those things in comparison to Christ and to see that really, in comparison, they, they have no worth. And Father, even though you've given us many valuable and wonderful and worthwhile things, family and friendships, and, and Lord, a chance to serve you and live and work and be healthy, even those things, Father, we need you to help us put them in their proper place 
And Lord, we can understand that maybe in 2020 with coronavirus and other challenges, you're helping us to turn our eyes off of this world. Father, forgive us. We get distracted by things like news. We get distracted by social media. We get distracted by the daily routine. And Father, we need you in the quiet of our days, uh, Father, to carve out the time to be in your word, to look at your son, Jesus Christ, and to be as excited as Paul, as joyous as Paul, to know him and all that is in him. We thank you, Father, for the gift you gave us of Jesus Christ. We ask that you would forgive us for not recognizing and not pursuing all this grace in a much greater way. So, Father, help us to live by any means we can to know more and more of your Son and to glorify you with how we live our lives. We ask that you would help us in these ways. In Jesus' name, amen.